for, for having me, um, even, even virtually. It's nice to see some, some faces uh, that are familiar. So I'll be talking today about a few projects in galaxy evolution, hence the kind of broad uh, title. And this is work that's been done in collaboration with a lot of really fantastic folks, both at Berkeley and beyond. But I do especially want to highlight my thesis advisor, Mariska Creek. All right, so when we are starting to try and answer this question of how galaxies evolve over, over cosmic time, there's a couple different routes that we can go. And of course, we can start by just looking at galaxies in the local universe and taking detailed images and spectroscopy and trying to figure out what the physical processes are that are shaping these galaxies. But the reason that I really love studying galaxy evolution is that we don't get just this kind of end snapshot of what galaxies look like today. By looking at galaxies uh, that are far away, we're also getting a view into the distant past. And the, the universe at you know, Redshift 2 and beyond, this is just a, a cutout from one of the Candles Deep Fields, the universe looked very different uh, at, those, at those early times. And many of these properties that we can look at of galaxies have evolved significantly since then. And in particular, galaxy sizes have grown, their morphologies have changed, they've gone from these kind of clumpy, uh, bursty things to these well-settled disks and these large quiescent elliptical galaxies that we see this high fraction of in, in the local universe. And of course, the fundamental question that we're trying to answer is how we get from there to these galaxies that we see today. And in particular, in this talk, I'm going to focus on two kind of sub questions of that. Um, so first, I'll be talking about how galaxies grow over time, what that size evolution actually looks like and how we can do a good job of, of characterizing it. And then I'll focus in on this question of why we see this bimodality between galaxies that are forming stars and galaxies that aren't. Because of that, um, you know, of course, that, that implies that there's some process that shuts down star formation in galaxies, but we still don't really have a good handle on the detailed physics that's, that's causing that transformation. So the first part of my talk, I'll mostly talk about uh, sizes and galaxy growth and then, and then get a little bit into this quenching question towards the end. So just to orient you with a kind of cartoonified version of the, of the size mass uh, plot for galaxies, uh, we see that both star forming galaxies here in blue and quiescent galaxies in red lie on this fairly well uh, uh, size mass relation, where at fixed stellar mass, quiescent galaxies tend to be smaller than their star forming counterparts. And this picture, this is the relation in, in the redshift zero universe, and the picture looks fairly similar if we go to higher redshifts, except the normalizations of both of these relations just decrease. So going from redshift two, uh, redshift zero back to redshift two, these things just shift down. And so this, this makes sense, I think, for the star forming galaxies, because between redshift two and today, they're continuing to form stars. So it, it kind of makes sense that they also might be growing. But it's a lot harder to explain for these quiescent galaxies because, of course, they're not they're not forming any stars anymore. So why are we seeing this huge size uh, growth? And you know, in particular, they're they're more than doubling or tripling their sizes, which is very difficult to explain. And this was really surprising when folks first figured this out. And so there's been a lot of work trying to figure out just exactly what is causing this size growth of quiescent galaxies. And there's two kind of explanations that have arisen to, to explain this size growth. The first is that individual quiescent galaxies are, are growing after they've stopped forming stars. And the way that they're doing that is by undergoing these minor mergers, which are essentially just adding small amounts of mass to their outskirts and, and puffing the galaxies up. And so this is this idea of inside out growth. But you can actually go out and measure the number of minor mergers um, at these redshifts, and you find that the, the growth that you get from minor mergers is not actually sufficient to explain the full size growth that, that folks are observing in the quiescent population. And so there has to be you know, something else that's also going on. And so another kind of competing explanation for explaining this size growth is that it's not necessarily that individual galaxies are, are changing their sizes, it's that we're observing some kind of uh, change in the population of quiescent galaxies over time. So if the quiescent galaxies that are quenching later are also larger, then you can get a change in the median size of the quiescent population when you look over time, not because individual galaxies are actually growing, but just because you're changing the population that you're looking at. So 
the field has kind of settled on, on some kind of combination of both this inside out growth and this progenitor bias being responsible in, in roughly equal parts for the size growth of Chrysin galaxies. But the thing that I wanna talk about mostly today is that almost all of these studies have been done using the light profiles of galaxies because of course we're astronomers and light is what we, what we fairly easily have access to. But unfortunately, light is also a biased tracer of stellar mass. And if you have any radial variations in stellar population properties across your galaxy, that creates mass to light ratio gradients. And so those are observable as, as color gradients. And so the situation that you want to be in when you're trying to use half light radii as a probe of how big galaxies are, is you're kind of assuming that you have the same color throughout your galaxy, you have a flat mass to light ratio, because then your mass profile and your light profile are the same. And so when you look at your half light radius, that's a good tracer of the underlying mass distribution. But you could also fairly easily imagine that you could instead be in a case like this, where the outskirts of your galaxy here are redder, uh, either because they're older or they're dustier or they have more metals. And in this case, your mass profile is more extended than your light profile. And so you're not getting a good idea of how large your galaxy actually is when you're just looking at the light. Or you could have, of course, the opposite where the center is redder and then your mass profile is, is more compact than your light profile. And you could easily imagine kind of situations that would give you these types of, of radial color gradients. Like here, you know, what if you have a centrally concentrated starburst that puts a lot of young stars at the center of your galaxy? Or here, what if you have something that has, say, a bulge in the center? And so accounting for these color gradients um, is really necessary in order to understand kind of the, the true size evolution of galaxies. Because if we're looking at uh, just how their half light radii are changing over time, we're kind of getting not just their size evolution, but also potential evolution in the strengths of these color gradients. And so we went out to, to go uh, measure these color gradients in galaxies in kind of a systematic way for a large sample across redshift. Um, so uh, our sample is now quite, quite a few galaxies at, at redshift less than about two and a half. And these are all things that are in these, uh, these candles deep fields. So they all have multiband high resolution HST imaging that's all convolved to the same point spread function. Uh, and I'm not actually really gonna talk about the methods. It's like to, to kind of simplify, it's we're doing spatially resolved um, spectral energy distribution fitting combined with some, some forward modeling to account for the point spread function. Um, I've thought a lot about the details for this and we've tested a few different methods. Um, so that's all in this 2019A paper or I'm super happy to answer questions if, if folks have, have any um, towards the end about, about the actual methods. Uh, but for now, I kind of want to just get into what we actually found once we went out and measured these mass profiles and these half mass radii. And so the first thing that we can ask is essentially, you know, was it worth going, going through all of this trouble to measure these mass profiles um, by asking the question of whether or not this actually affects the evolution of the size mass relation. And so here I'm showing just the strength of these color gradients as probed by like the half mass radius divided by the half light radius. So this dashed line means that the whole galaxy is the same color. This means down here means redder centers or, or bluer centers up here. And so what I find is that these color gradients in both star forming and quiescent galaxies are essentially flat at high redshift. And then they actually decrease um, quite sharply towards the redder center edge um, of this diagram down to about redshift of one or so, and then they flatten below that. And this has not really been seen before. And it's really interesting because it means that half mass radii actually have a different redshift evolution than half light radii do. And so the view that we were getting of the galaxy size mass relation before uh, was looking again, not just at the actual size evolution of these galaxies, but also at this, this fairly strong color gradient evolution that I'm showing here. But now that we have these uh, you know, color gradients measured, I can plot the, the actual evolution of the half mass radii over cosmic time. And here I'm just gonna think about the, the quiescent galaxies, uh, because again, I was talking about this, this kind of huge growth, especially here at early times. So this is just the size at fixed mass. So like one point on that, on that size mass relation as a function of either look back time or redshift, whichever you prefer. 
Uh, and this is the evolution of, of half light radii of quiescent galaxies. And like I said, you can, you can predict how much you expect these galaxies to grow from minor mergers. And if I put that model, um, this one is, this is a model from Drew Newman on, on here, uh, we see that this minor merger model does an okay job at low redshift predicting this relatively moderate size growth. But there's this big gap at high redshift where this model is not able to produce the full um, you know, kind of growth that's seen in these half-light radii of quiescent galaxies. It's about a factor of two, um, two, two shallow. But when I plot the evolution of half-mass radii, it actually does go right through this, this, um, this minor merger track. And so what we're saying here is that uh, the, the size growth of quiescent galaxies is actually fully consistent with this model. It's just that uh, we're, we had to account for these, these evolving color gradients. And so it doesn't seem like this progenitor bias is um, required to explain a large amount of the size growth of, of quiescent galaxies, at least at these redshifts. All right, so um, the, the next thing that I kind of wanna talk about is, is how we actually get quiescent galaxies. Because of course, just looking at this size evolution of the whole quiescent population doesn't really tell us about uh, what's shutting down star formation. And there are some clues that we can use galaxy sizes and structures to probe this question of, of what's responsible for quenching. Um, so like I said before, quiescent galaxies are smaller than their star forming counterparts. But folks have also uh, observed before that the youngest quiescent galaxies seem even smaller. So this is a plot um, a few years ago from Omar Almeni. This is just the size mass plane with star forming galaxies in blue, quiescent galaxies in red. And then these black points are post starburst galaxies. These are, are the youngest quiescent galaxies. And you can see here, especially at, at high masses, they seem to be smaller than both star forming and quiescent galaxies. And this is telling us that something about the process that shut down star formation in these galaxies potentially really shrunk them down from their star forming sizes and then they had to grow again along the quiescent sequence. Um, and so the question that I have now is, is does this result uh, hold when we're considering these half mass radii? And in order to answer this question, you know, I don't have spectra for all of these galaxies. They're, they're all uh, kind of, you know, photometry from candles. So I need a good way to, to estimate the ages along the quiescent sequence. And so I've actually used a um, result from Sirio from last year where he went out and, and took a bunch of spectra and found that you can do a good job at estimating the sizes on the quiescent sequence just by where galaxies lie on this, this UVJ color color plot. So I can take his results and essentially age date my, my whole quiescent sample and divide them into kind of these young quiescent galaxies or the post starburst like things versus these older quiescent galaxies. And then I can look at how the sizes of these two populations uh, differ. So this is kind of the, the picture that I was showing before, just now with my data set of how the half light radii of these galaxies look. So these are uh, just individual points colored by their inferred age. And then median bins of both the old quiescent population here and then the post starburst or young quiescent galaxies down here. And so we see again this, this you know, gap in the, in the sizes of these things um, as, a, as a function of age where the younger quiescent galaxies look smaller. But when I plot instead the half mass radii of these galaxies, that size difference again mostly disappears. So it seems like these post starburst galaxies are not actually significantly smaller at fixed mass than their older quiescent counterparts. But the fact that the, you know, the picture in light sizes versus mass sizes looks different means that these two populations have to have uh, differences in the strengths of their color gradients. Because that's essentially what's making the left and the right side different here. So I can plot um, their, their color gradient strength. So again, this is just the dashed line means flat. Uh, the bottom half is red centers or, or blue centers. And this time this is a function of inferred age along the quiescent sequence. And these are just the individual points in my sample in three different redshift bins and then a, a best fit. And indeed, we see that color gradient strengths are changing along the quiescent sequence. And so the, these post-starburst galaxies seem to have essentially flat color gradients. 
And then they become gradually stronger towards this redder uh, center's uh, side as, as quiescent galaxies are aging along the, along the sequence. And so again, this is telling us, great, um, that, that these things are, uh, are not actually really significantly smaller. They just have systematically different color gradients. And so to kind of try and put this all, all together um, into a broader picture of how these galaxies are evolving along, along the quiescent sequence from, from their structures, here's just, this is the full mass profiles of all the galaxies in this sample, all the quiescent galaxies binned by their inferred age, and then color gradient strengths and, and half mass radii. And so to kind of take you through what I'm seeing along the quiescent sequence, putting this together, is that as galaxies are, are getting older, as we're going towards the purple colors um, here, uh, they're becoming more massive and they're also becoming larger. Um, we can see that here. And then we can go look at these mass profiles and ask how they're building up that mass. And this zoom in of this, their central kiloparsec shows, you know, all these profiles are essentially the same in the center, but the mass that they're adding, these quiescent galaxies as they age, is being added to their outskirts out here. And then we can also look at the, the strength of their color gradients, which again is going towards kind of the redder centers, bluer outskirts. And so that's kind of implying that the mass that's being added to these galaxies potentially is, is bluer on the outskirts. And this seems to be all kind of consistent with this picture where these quiescent galaxies are growing inside out via minor mergers, because again, that should be puffing up their outsides, but leaving their centers essentially unchanged. And then also, you know, you're expecting that the, the stars that you're adding in those mergers are coming from lower mass, lower metallicity galaxies, so they should be bluer. And then the other thing that this is uh, telling us is that these post-starburst galaxies seem to be the result of kind of a rapid quenching process that's requiring some sort of structural change because they've already built up these massive centers that are required for quiescence, um, but they also, something has happened to flatten their color gradients out from the star forming population. And so in my last like two minutes, I wanna kind of just dive a little bit more into these post-starburst galaxies as probes of quenching and talk just super briefly about, um, about some results where we've looked at kind of a multi-wavelength study of these post-starburst galaxies to really try and figure out why they've, they've shut down their star formation. Um, so we've looked for these post-starburst galaxies at, at slightly lower redshifts, about 0.7, so that we can do these multi-wavelength follow-ups. Um, I've, I've selected a big sample from Sloan. This is what their, their spectra look like. Um, they look a lot like A-type stars. Um, and like I said, we're really doing a multi-wavelength follow-up. This is called the Squiggle Survey, um, which is a, a long convoluted acronym. I figured I should uh, make one of those up in order for them to actually give me a PhD because of course astronomers love our convoluted acronyms. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different properties, their kinematics, their AGN fractions, a lot of, a lot of things like that, but also about their molecular gas reservoirs because of course stars are forming out of molecular gas. And so if they stopped forming stars, maybe it's because they ran out of fuel. So just quickly, um, some results there. This is star formation rate versus molecular gas mass. This is essentially the kennecott schmidt relation. And these are a bunch of normal galaxies at redshift zero or, or higher redshift. And we went and took ALMA data for some of these post-starburst things. And we found that they actually have significant molecular gas reservoirs. So they're really offset from this expected relation. Uh, which is really strange because why do they have so much gas that they're not forming new stars out of? Uh, and we were really surprised and excited by this. So we went and took ALMA data of a bunch more of these post-starburst galaxies the next cycle. And we found four of them that again, have these really significant molecular gas reservoirs and gas fractions of something like 20%, despite the fact that again, they're not forming any stars out of this gas. We also got a bunch of non-detections, which you know we can see the stack um, of those, but there it's kind of at the edge of what you would expect from this kind of Kitchmet relation. And again, this is a factor of like 30 in CO luminosity here, despite the fact that this is optically a pretty uniform sample. So this is saying that something is happening to the, the molecular gas in these galaxies on fairly short timescales. And I've actually gone and fit all of the star formation histories of these things using Prospector, which of course is, is developed out of, out of Harvard, um, to get constraints on how long these galaxies have been quenched. 
And it looks like, uh, this is now gas mass versus time since quenching, and it looks like the gas that we're seeing in these galaxies is there on extremely short time scales after quenching, and then really just disappears at something like this kind of 0.2 or 0.3 giga year um, mark. So it seems like these things can, uh, can quench with gas, but then it disappears on short time scales. All right, so I wanna leave you with just, uh, just a few main takeaway points. So first, um, I think we really need to account for these color gradients and their, their evolution uh, over time when we're doing these studies of galaxy sizes. And in particular, I've showed that quiescent galaxies uh, evolve much slower than you would expect from their half-light radii. And actually that growth is fully consistent with this minor merger growth model. And then I've also showed that the youngest quiescent galaxies aren't actually significantly smaller than their older counterparts. They again, just have systematic differences in their color gradients. And then lastly, I talked a little bit about post-starburst galaxies as these laboratories to study quenching. And we found that galaxies can quench while retaining large molecular gas reservoirs, but there's some hints that that, that gas mass is, is correlated with the time since quenching. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for, for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. We have a bunch of questions. Um, so uh, we'll get through some right now and then um, there'll be time for more online. Um, so. One of the first questions um, is from Avi Loeb, who's asking um, about the non-baryonic mass in, in these regions. So if I understand correctly, when we're um, better accounting for the colors of stars and their differences, we're still talking about the stellar yeah, yeah. mass. Yeah, so this is, all, this is all stellar mass. So um, yeah, so. Are there reasons that the um, dark matter mass would evolve in these? Uh, different cases and um, or is basically this region that we're probing always mostly baryonic? Um, yeah, so I think I think this is all going to be mostly mostly baryonic and I, I, I don't think right now we really have the data to test that because I think measuring dynamical masses is much harder than measuring stellar masses of course yeah. observationally. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there's, you know, there's important things, especially with this quenching question of what's going on with, with dark matter halos. And so I think there are a lot of interesting questions there. I just haven't um, put a lot of thought into that just yet. But yeah, yeah. these measurements are all stellar mass. Yeah. Um, MJ Park is asking, um, I was wondering how the gas fractions of mergers would affect the size of evolution of galaxies. And would the fact that mergers at higher redshifts tend to be um, gaseous be part of the reason why the minor merger module does not match well with the half-light radii um, oh, yeah, of the quiescent galaxies question. at high redshift. Yeah, so normally when we're talking about this kind of minor merger growth, they're, they're fairly dry mergers that we're talking about. Um, of course, that, that does evolve with redshift. Um, I can't remember all of the details of, of Drew's model, but I do think that the, the different tracks at different redshifts, he has assumed something about the, the actual gas fractions um, from the measurements. But um, I would have to go, go look at that more. Um, but I think my, my measurements are arguing that a lot of this, um, the reason that this model isn't fitting is, is maybe because of the color gradient evolution. Interesting. MJ, do you want to chime in? Did I miss details there that um, you'd like to follow up on? I think you're still muted. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, Sandro Tequila is asking, um, what's the about the sample a little bit more? So, what is the um, completeness uh, that have half mass size estimates? And are you able to do something like a number density? Um, uh, and measure whether the small quiescent galaxies um, fraction essentially evolves over time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so 
So we have had to do a, a cut on essentially signal to noise in order to measure color gradients. So it's kind of a cut on, on F160. Um, at, I, I forget exactly what, what sigma detection for, for that. Um, and so we've gone through an estimated mass completeness limits using kind of the same technique that, um, that Adam Muzzin has used for the Ultra Vista sample. Um, but because we're putting in that signal to noise cut, which kind of eventually corresponds, of course, to a, to a mass um, cut, it's a little bit hard to do the number densities because if you want to get an extremely like good estimate of your completeness, you're really just getting the highest mass things and the brightest mm -hmm. things. So I thought about doing, doing number densities um, and just haven't gotten to it yet because it looks like we're uh, mostly going to be doing the, the kind of high mass end. But the 90% mass completeness is something like 10 to the 10 across redshift. Awesome. Um, so I have one last question, which is, I guess, a, a, a mashing together of, of what I've been wondering about and, and a question that Anna um, Bonazza asked, which is, um, since uh, not myself, but a lot of the people on this call are, are people who are involved in running the illustrious simulations, um, what can we learn from comparing to cosmological simulations of galaxy formation? And in particular, I was wondering about two things. Um, uh, one is this idea of the merger history. Um, and uh, I was wondering about um, like computing the sorts of gradients that you are able to measure in the simulations and whether that's been done. Um, and then the second thing is, um, do you feel just sort of at, in, as we step forward that like directly comparing this particular observable is a useful way to distinguish between the sort of um, quenching mechanisms that we have to put into the simulations essentially, or the recipes. Um, mm -hmm. Like, do you think that this is a good avenue towards backing out some of the physical properties of uh, yeah, of so this for process? sure, I do. I think um, I think that in order to really make that step, it's good to go kind of beyond these color gradients that I've been measuring into actually okay. understanding whether or not these are age gradients or metallicity gradients or um, some combination of dust gradients that I'm not totally modeling. Right. And so I think once you get to kind of the level of, of looking at age and metallicity gradients, those are actually really great to compare to theoretical predictions because it's telling you something about how you're assembling your stars and where the gas that you're making those stars out of is, is coming from. And so I've actually looked a lot into kind of thinking about how to use these to um, kind of constrain quenching mechanisms. And I think it's doable. Uh, at least from the kind of the simulation front as something to compare to. And then on the observational side, uh, right now, of course, we can, we can either kind of get that differentiation of if they're age, metallicity, or dust by looking at, say, like IFU studies where we're actually able to look at the spectral lines. And so that's something that you can compare to for small numbers of galaxies right now. But then also, once we have this, uh, you know, amazing uh, web data, um, in, in the longer wavelength regime, you can start breaking those age metallicity dust degeneracies for photometric samples as well. And so I think that is a really promising avenue for, for comparing. And I would love for, you know, to talk about comparing sizes. I think it's, it's really difficult to do it um, in a uniform way between the simulations and the observations, just because a lot of times we're kind of talking about different things. Um, and so, yeah, would love to chat about that more. Awesome. Um, well, we have a couple more questions that I wasn't able to get to, um, mm -hmm. but we should move on to our second speaker. But thank you so much for yeah, a really thank interesting you so much. I'll, discussion. I'll check the Slack. Yeah. Awesome. And then also, if anybody wanted to meet, I'm, I'm around if you yeah, want to do the one. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. Thanks, Jen. Mm -hmm. Let's turn over to our next speaker. Jens Kluba is a professor of cosmology at the University of Manchester and he got his undergrad degree in physics from uh, University of Göttingen, where he studied the impact of internal cluster dynamics on the SC effect. Um, and then he moved to MPA and Ludwig Maximilians University for his PhD, where he studied uh, the spectral distortions of the CMB. 
And through the years, he has explored a number of topics in early universe cosmology from uh, the impact of uh, the primordial magnetic fields might have on the heating uh, the, the matter in the universe and all, to, all the way to uh, effects of dark matter annihilation. And at the same time, he also developed uh, huge pieces of code that has been really crucial in analysis of cosmological data, especially from Planck mission. And today, though, we're sort of going back to his uh, original uh, uh, topic of CMD spectral distortions, and you will hear about some current challenges and also new opportunities with this uh, features. So with that, take it away, Jens. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anna. Um, can everybody hear me and, and see my slides? That's all up? Okay, great. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for having me speak here. I would, of course, have been really happy to come and I'm happy to see many faces, uh, familiar faces um, in the audience. Um, I'm going to try to excite you uh, about spectral distortions. And for those of you who have uh, heard uh, me speak about this, uh, I hope that I will have several things that are going to be exciting and beyond what you have heard about. And then of course, uh, for those uh, who have not heard about spectral distortions, I'm going to try to give a little bit of a flavor of what's going on. So um, let us start with, I need to, yes. So let us start with the uh, nice picture of the cosmic microwave background, uh, the CMB anisotropies and the temperature. This is something that you probably have seen many times. And uh, these tiny fluctuations here from the Planck, uh, uh, measured by the Planck satellite, they have told us a great deal about cosmology and uh, the universe we live in. Um, here's just a one sli summary slide basically about the cosmological concordance model. I don't want to go into details. I think we all know we have a lambda CDM cosmology that is preferred. Um, precision of the parameters is extremely high and um, we, are, we, are, we, are, uh, we are having very good understanding of uh, both the early phases as well as late stages of the universe. And of course, this was not just something that came in one day. Uh, there was lots of experiments which have led to this. And I'm here only focusing on the cosmic microwave background measurements. Of course, there was um, supernova data and of course, large scale structure. All these things go into this picture of the Lambda CDM cosmology, but nevertheless, great progress over many years uh, and a lot of uh, things to look forward to as well with uh, the upcoming coming measurements uh, of the primordial B modes. Uh, which are which are going to tell us more about the cosmology we live in, but I'm not going to talk about the CMB anisotropies. I just wanted to remind everybody the the CMB anisotropies are great and have been really really uh, extremely useful. But there is a second part of the cosmic microwave background which we can look at, and that is the average sky spectrum. So uh, we are no longer looking at different uh, comparing temperatures in different directions, but we are basically taking the average sky and we're looking at the differences in frequency. So uh, the real frequency dependence of the microwave background emission. And we know that that is given by a black body to extremely high precision. And uh, this we know since the measurements by Kobe Firas uh, many, many uh, years ago. And uh, when I'm talking about spectral distortions, I'm talking about small departures from this average black body spectrum that we normally refer to uh, as the you know, best, per, uh, most perfect black body that we have in the universe. And these small departures, that's what spectral distortions are. So departures from black body shape. How can these be, be created? Well, if we have something like energy release or injection of photons or particles, something that perturbs the equilibrium between matter and radiation, you can create a, a spectral distortion. One typical spectral distortion, here are some nice figures from uh, original papers from by Rashid and, uh, and Saldovich. Um, uh, the, these, uh, uh, the, the most uh, commonly known one is the uh, so-called Y-type distortion, which is also connect in connection with clusters. We all have probably heard about this, the sunyaev seldovich effect. So you have the CMB photons coming through hot medium and you get an upscattering of photons uh, where you move the intrinsic black body. You just uh, differentially move photons upwards and basically get an upscattering effect. That is a distortion that is introduced at low redshifts, which means for me below 50,000. So obviously uh, people who are working on galaxies are laughing. Um, yes, uh, so uh, 50,000, uh, that is the time when continuization starts being inefficient. And if you go into earlier redshifts, so the high redshift uh, universe, then you have actually many interactions with the electrons, photons and, and electrons can equilibrate and you get the so-called chemical potential type distortion. Uh, it's basically the equilibrium of the black body, which is not having the perfect match of number and energy density. So these two types of distortions are the characteristic 
uh, classical distortions that we normally think about. And the mu distortion is something that can only be created in the early universe. So this is really an important point to uh, keep in mind. Okay, so let's go. Here's a nice picture of the evolution of the universe. We have probably all seen this in one or the other way, uh, where we think about the Big Bang and inflation, setting up initial conditions, and then the universe expands, cools down, all the, all the interesting things happening. One of the most important eras, uh, or, or very important eras, is, uh, is the recombination era, where we start seeing the CB anisotropies, and then there's all the fun things happening at low redshifts with galaxies and so on. Okay, CMB anisotropies are literally what we are studying to learn about the initial conditions. And then of course, there's interesting things uh, being introduced by, uh, by the large scale structure in the later phases as well. Um, but when we're talking about spectral distortions, we're actually talking about the thermal history of the universe and spectral distortions probe the thermal history of the universe over uh, a, a wide range of times, um, starting a couple of months after the Big Bang until today. So if you have some energy release injection, you get a distortion, as I said, mu and y type distortions, that's the classical kind of uh, thing you're thinking about. And you're learning something about a vast range of, uh, of uh, uh, times. And you have also the pre-recombination injection that can give you some information about uh, stuff happening before the last scattering surface. So this is a new window to the early universe and there's a lot of discovery space. I'm going to try to allude to that. So here's uh, another sketch showing the classical picture. So the mu type distortion in the early phases and the y type distortion in the late phases. Um, Seldovich and, and Rashid Sunyaev here. And then there's also the so-called temperature error because you have thermalization being extremely efficient and you're basically able to thermalize any distortion you would be creating. So that's the classical picture. But since a couple of years, we have now understood that there's actually an intermediate phase between the mu and y era, which doesn't make this transition between mu and y just abrupt, but it's actually a gradual transition. And there's kind of an information you can actually hope to get because these, uh, the spectra in the transition era um, are not just given by the superposition of the three extreme cases. So this gives you time dependent information, which is really interesting. And one of the things that has, uh, has been recently understood more. And then there's also something happening with hydrogen and helium recombination, which I will get to uh, hopefully at the end. Okay, and then uh, we can also talk not about energy release, but we can also talk about injection of photons. And in that, that case, you actually get distortions in particular in the late phases, like the Y type era, um, you actually get distortions, which can be much, much richer. Uh, and I will come back to that uh, hopefully at the end of the talk. But uh, it is not the standard mu and y type distortions, uh, which you're getting there, but you can actually thermalize and Comptonize uh, the distribution functions. So you get actually really interesting signals and they can tell you something about the nature of the injection process, for example. We also understand the fundamental processes really, really well now. Compton scattering, I mentioned already, there's the other thing which you need to uh, do is adjust the photon number um, that is Bremsstrahlung, which is which everybody knows about. And then there's the so-called double Compton process. I don't want to go into details, but we can now calculate these really, really accurately. And, and there has been actually recent work which, which really made this now uh, very precise. Although these are very classical processes, there was no way, um, a simple way to just include this calculation uh, in an efficient and quick way. And now we are, we are able to do this. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this, uh, this um, uh, spectrum the measurement of Kobe virus, here's these numbers, mu and y. So I introduced mu and y, but I didn't mention them before. We see that these numbers are extremely small. So why is this interesting at all? Well, the numbers are very, very small, but there's uh, of course a lot of experimental progress that we know has happened in CMB anisotropies, you know, from Kobe to Planck, lots of uh, sensitivity and uh, uh, resolution improvement. And in, in the spectral distortion domain, we're still 25 years uh, behind. We're basically still talking about Kobe virus being the state of the art, which is which is really outstanding achievement of Kobe virus. But of course, we understand that there is possibilities go, to go beyond. And um, you probably have heard about Pixie as one of the concepts that has been pushed forward in this direction. Um, this is something that uh, people have talked about, uh, both in connection with the primordial B modes as well as spectral distortions, where the hope is to improve the spectral distortion measurements by a factor of uh, 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 basically a thousand. 
Um, so I don't want to go into the experimental details here, but this is not the only idea uh, because since uh, then there has been uh, several ideas pushed, put forward. So for example, there's the Apsera uh, experiment, which is a ground-based uh, bolometer array, which might be looking at for the low frequency recombination lines. Um, it's basically just above the 21 centimeter uh, lines of our, of our galaxy. So in the two to six gigahertz regime, so very low frequency measurements. Um, I just spoke to Ravi Subramanian and he has now moved to uh, Australia and he's actually going to pick up this kind of uh, thing again and now put some uh, prototype development in. Um, there's also initiatives uh, with the Italian colleagues, uh, which are trying to measure the, mu, uh, the white type distortion from the ground, the Cosmo at Dom C, using the facilities they have at uh, the Concordia station at Dom C. And this is not just uh, an idea, this is actually happening. So here's Elia Battistelli uh, putting together some of the cryostat, uh, Silvia Massi is here, and, and Paolo de Bernardes. These are the folks which are really pushing this forward, and it's really exciting to see that this is real, right? We also have uh, had many activities. Um, here is a workshop that we organized a couple of years ago at CERN, Rashid here in the front, very happy, uh, Super Saka as well. Um, uh, Mark is somewhere in the back uh, and uh, here's Al Kogut. Um, and we are all discussing, you know, what are the uh, interesting things one could do and what are the experimental things that we have to, uh, how can we get this really happening? And here's Joe Silk talking about ideas to go even to the moon. Um, luckily my camera was uh, uh, not having, uh, you know, something was going wrong with this, but uh, yeah, this is one of the ideas that, uh, that was, uh, was being put forward there as well. Okay, and then, uh, of course, also in general, we know there's the decadal review. We have been putting forward white papers in that. We have actually proposed to CNES uh, several concepts of, you know, going for spectral distortions. And this is all something that is actually uh, looking like it's, uh, you know, there's many, many pro uh, promising avenues. And then last but not least, um, Voyage 2050 is the big call uh, from the ESA, uh, from, from the European Space Agency, to actually ask for what is the kind of experimental possibilities one would uh, be looking at. And there we again have put forward some uh, white papers explaining what is really interesting about this. So lots of activity and um, uh, uh, I, I want to put into perspective now several signals. Um, which I, I think uh, will be very helpful. So here is uh, basically uh, redshift. And here you, you heard about the mu and y type distortion. So the mu type distortion in the early phases and then the y type distortion in the late phases. And here think of this uh, vertical axis as signals level. And here's a couple of experimental concepts. So FIWAS uh, in this scale is up here. Then Bizu as a balloon uh, um, is, is probably going to reach somewhere there. And then as you see here, more and more ambitious experimental concepts which have been discussed. So uh, let's, let's pu pull out the standard signals that we expect. Um, these are coming from the low redshift universe. The largest signals are coming actually from Z clusters, the cumulative flux of Z clusters, basically the upscattering of, of the CMB photons and their relativistic correction. Um, intensity mapping and line scattering signals. These are things that you can, uh, in principle, be looking at at the largest scales with low and, uh, angular resolution absolute spectroscopy. Um, and then the other expected signals, as you can see, several orders of magnitudes uh, in, in, in sensitivity, you, you have many, many uh, orders of magnitudes of gains that you need in order to tap these signals. So one of the most promising and interesting signals in terms of cosmology is the damping uh, signal uh, from the damping of acoustic modes at small scales. And then there's the recombination lines, uh, which are also extremely in interesting. I will probably try to uh, skim over them if I have enough time. Um, so these are the guaranteed signals and you can in principle design your experiments to get them. And uh, as you can tell here from the scale, things like Super Pixie and Voyage 2050, very ambitious uh, experiments, they might actually be able to get there. Okay, but then even if you don't reach to these uh, levels of precision, there's still a huge amount of discovery space. We can actually, you know, by just reducing the limits on the mu parameter, we can actually probe many, many processes. And this is, of course, extremely interesting, in particular when you think about non-standard physics, which uh, we have, uh, you know, heard about in many, many occasions, like annihilation, decaying particles, um, primordial black holes, uh, magnetic fields, and uh, even small-scale enhancement of the power spectrum. So this is really exciting. And um, uh, I think there will be lots of progress in this direction and more understanding of what's going on. And I'm really glad that I have a, a big team uh, in Manchester now helping me with, the, with this big challenge, not only doing the theoretical calculations, but also uh, looking at the, uh, at the experimental possibilities and optimizing designs of experiments and so on. There's a long way to go. 
Okay, I want to go uh, quickly through a couple of cases in more detail. So here's the white type distortion from the cumulated flux of clusters in the universe. Um, I, 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 I will just mention this. this is a booming signal. This will be guaranteed uh, detection, even in, with foreground margin, marginalization. We have very little doubt that this could be reachable from, uh, from space uh, for sure. And it's, uh, it's a wide type distortion of the order of 10 to minus six. So here's the negative branch, here's the null at 270 gigahertz. And this is the positive branch where you have the upscattering of photons. And then you have here the relativistic correction to it because the clusters are hot. They have several kV temperature. So you actually need to take into account that they have relativistically high uh, speeds, the electrons in the, in the medium, and therefore you get relativistic corrections. If you measure both of these uh, parts, you can actually look at, um, um, and you can actually constrain here in the Y versus relativistic temperature uh, plane. You can actually constrain feedback models and things like that. So you can learn something about the late universe and uh, formation of universe. And in uh, about 12 seconds, oh, okay. Um, I was predicting, but okay. Um, good, let's move on to the acoustic modes. The acoustic modes are really one of the things that the cosmologists are most excited about. So you have the small scale perturbations in the universe and they are damping away by silk damping. And that silk damping process is actually the equivalent of an energy release process because when you take black bodies of different temperatures, so here a picture with two temperatures, and you just take the sum of their spectra, you don't get the black body anymore. And taking the sum of spectra is the mixing process. And the mixing process is nothing else than Thomson scattering, swirling up the medium, making everything uniform. So this creates initially a white type distortion and then through Comptonization, you get a mu type distortion. So this is one of the predicted signals just coming from the small scale extrapolation of the uh, acoustic modes from scalar perturbations. And uh, this is here the calculation uh, that predicts that the uh, standard extra extrapolated uh, power from Planck should be giving a, a mu type distortion of two times 10 to minus eight. And the error bar is coming from the uncertainties in the uh, parameters predicting the, or describing the power spectrum of the, of the modes. So which modes are important? For Planck, we are looking at you know, scales of K of 10 to minus four to, 10 to let's say one for large scale structure and Planck and so on. And then we have many, many modes at small scales as well. In principle, one would expect a flat power spectrum if you think about inflation, um, but we have only probed these and there's upper limits of course at very small scales. Spectral distortions will probe modes at the in the range of one inverse to a few times 10 to the four inverse megaparsecs. So very small scales. And if you actually make the numbers from Firas, then you can say Firas has already ruled out power in excess of order 10 to minus five in the perturbations, uh, scalar perturbations. And with Pixie, with a Pixie type experiment, after foreground marginalization, you even, you would be pushing this down. And of course, if you go super Pixie and Voyage 2050, you could even reach down to the level of, of uh, the prediction, predicted extrapolated power. So um, this is a guaranteed signal if you believe lambda CDM and the, the standard slow roll paradigm, but there's nobody telling you at this point that this is of course going to work. And we know that there's indications for things like primordial black holes maybe being present. That means we need to have at smaller scales, some enhancement of power. And if you have some enhancement here, then you need to go to a low uh, power there. That means you have some intermediate uh, range where you have some increase of power. That means there is a way to probe these kind of scenarios. In a very similar way, you can think about small scales being suppressed. For example, we know about the missing satellite problem and too big to fail, all these the small scale crisis. If there is a primordial origin of that, indeed the power spectrum is actually suppressed, then you would predict that the mu distortion has to be zero or very small. So there, there's basically ways, all this uh, um, signifies is you have ways to uh, probe the small scale power spectrum. Um, I'm very excited to also say uh, a few words about gravitational waves, which can be probed with, uh, with um, spectral distortions because uh, these gravitational waves, they also uh, induce uh, acoustic modes and those acoustic modes dissipate. And if you here look at you know, the uh, gravitational wave power spectrum, basically, um, you can see Lightbird and things like that through measurements of R, they can measure the large scales and the small scales are probed by many, many experiments. Spectral distortions would be probing regimes right in the middle between these two. And uh, this is work that uh, Tom Kite and Andrea Raveni have just completed. This is, the details are in the archive. And it is really interesting because it's bridging the gap between the two uh, uh, regimes. And you can think about things like phase transitions, non-standard physics. So this is exciting and interesting. I don't have much time left, but I want to just very br briefly mention, if you have, I mentioned the photon injection cases, 
but that was single injection. So these are the signals that were calculated. But if you now do decaying particles, you actually think of photons being injected. You can get a wide range of spectra and a wide range of signals. And I don't have time to go into details here, but this is work that I'm doing with Boris Bollier, um, who has just moved to, uh, to um, Columbia University. And we are actually using this to constrain the lifetime and the energy of the particles that could be injecting uh, energy. And we're talking here about very small uh, masses of particles or excited states uh, of dark matter and using virus and edges data. This is a paper that we're about to finish. I hope next week, maybe it will come out. Okay. I have 40, 50 seconds. And I want to talk about uh, the foregrounds very quickly, but I also want to mention the recommendation lines. We have now with Luke Hart done forecast for this. Uh, I will be very happy to, hear, uh, to have questions on this and use my 30 seconds uh, to talk about um, uh, the foreground problem. The, the elephant in the room is that we, I have glossed over foregrounds because these signals are tiny and there's lots of things in the middle. Thermal dust, we know this from, from Planck and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm lucky to have uh, Mathieu Ramazé and also Aditya Roti in my team who are both uh, really, uh, they, 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 they understand the challenge and they can deal with all this data. I'm, I, I'm, without them, I wouldn't be able to, to do any of these calculations. So the, the nice thing is that we are dealing with it and we're looking at it uh, and we're trying to really estimate what is the challenges with foregrounds. And uh, here's a work that uh, I have done a, a little bit earlier with uh, Max Abedgold and Colin Hill uh, where we did a Fisher forecast, including all kinds of foregrounds and showing what levels of precision we can get. And this was then picked up and refined by Aditya uh, to uh, use this as forecasts for uh, the Voyage 2050 uh, uh, concepts. And you can see here, the recommendation lines are basically at the very, very small level here. And uh, the signals that we're looking at are very small in comparison to the foreground. So you need to really be uh, measuring very precisely at many, many frequencies and use all the information. And we are also now, uh, moving beyond the Fisher forecast, I'm, I'm nearly done, uh, really taking into account spatial variations and things like that. Uh, there's a nice paper that Aditya pu published a couple of uh, months ago now, and we're working now on a real detailed forecast, including spatial variations and everything. And it's obvious that there's many challenges to tackle. How do you include averaging processes? And in fact, when you really want to deal with the problem, it's much better to not use parametric uh, methods, but actually go for uh, blind methods, which are basically ignorant or as ignorant as possible about the foregrounds and the challenges so that you actually end up with, um, you targeting the signals rather than trying to reconstruct the foregrounds. And then how do we use external information? We will have so many measurements with galaxy catalogs and so on. All this has to be still worked out. And I, uh, there's a few more uh, bullets here, of course, but I think I should really finish here and just wrap up. There's really exciting uh, avenues forward, I think, with spectral distortions. Um, there's guaranteed signals, but there's also predicted unexpected signals, uh, um, uh, um, discovery space. You can really uh, learn something about the universe, physics, and particle physics. So this is really, really interesting. And I think um, we are having the hope that there is maybe going to be some improvements over Kobe virus in the next uh, um, decades to come. Uh, obviously, it's very challenging, but it's extremely interesting, I think. Thank you. Sorry for being a bit long. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> and I take questions, obviously. Yeah. So um, we have a couple questions that I'll sort of wrap all into one, and maybe we can dig into more of the details later online. But um, I think people are wondering, um, including Anna and Avi, um, about uh, the nature of the foregrounds in particular and where you think, um, which foregrounds you think will be easy to deal with um, so and which you think will be the most challenging and if you can elaborate on that. Um, so no foreground will be easy to deal with. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's all enough. very, it's, it's a huge dynamic range. We're talking basically several orders of magnitudes uh, excess of foregrounds versus, uh, versus the signal. But um, uh, we can benefit, of course, from uh, from the multi-frequency coverage, and in that way, uh, really, really help uh, cleaning things. And then, even low resolution will still be helping you with some of the spatial information that you can have. Um, what we found in our work with uh, with Max uh, was that low frequency foregrounds, in particular, um, uh, and the coverage at low frequencies was very, very important for detection of mu, because uh, the mu signal, um, the null, is uh, 
shifted with respect to the uh, null of the Y type distortion. The Y type distortion has a null at 270 gigahertz, and the mu distortion has a 230 gigahertz, uh, 130 gigahertz, excuse me. And um, uh, this this shift uh, um, it, it makes the mu distortion be slightly more degenerate. Uh, with, for example, the temperature of the monopole and uh, the, the the small uncertainty in the monopole, there is just uh, it, it seems that there, a lot of information is gleaned, in, in fact, from the low frequency part. So Y type distortions, if we, if we, for example, take away uh, low frequency coverage, then the mu type distortion is just starting to become uh, harder to, to detect. Um, so I think low frequency foregrounds are, are a challenge. Um, and there we have things like the AMI, uh, the anomalous uh, microwave emission. We also have uh, right in the middle here, the integrated CO emission, uh, which Avi has, has also been, uh, been working on and, and uh, in this context and showing uh, that it is of course a signal one should worry about. Um, but luckily this is again where the synergistic aspect might be coming into play. We are hoping that we will have tons of galaxy catalogs at that at some point as well. And we will maybe be able to even, you know, to some extent um, model in some way, at least part of this, uh, this kind of signal. And uh, then we also can hope for low frequency coverage, maybe even being, uh, being done or uh, uh, permitted at least in terms of uh, anisotropies from the ground with things like, uh, uh, CBUS and and uh, there's there's many there's several experiments which are also relevant to the B mode searches of course uh, in CMB. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, then then I, I want to say immediately a few things uh, to the the dust and CIB of course um, they are not single temperature of uh, modified black body spectra and that's where for example um, things like blind methods will come in. You want to not uh, put in. Uh, absolute parametric fits uh, and then realize that you're having big residuals which you're not going to get uh, not going to capture um, but you will reduce them of course um, but if you think about um, uh, semi-blind methods uh, where you actually do something like the ILC methods in CB analysis where you actually include some um, knowledge about the signal so for example in the CMB the spectrum of the CMB the, the temperature derivative um, or the Y type distortion or the mu type distortion, those would be signal uh, constraints, but you can then also put constraints on things like the uh, dust ampli uh, the dust, uh, uh, and also its spectral index and things like that. So these are moments of the uh, distribution functions which are literally capturing averaging effects. So we are hoping that by uh, subsequently adding more and more constraints, which also costs of course um, uh, signal to noise, uh, that one can actually get uh, get rid of uh, layer by layer these uh, signals and uh, the projections on onto each other are of course getting more and more small and and there one should by the way say although this white uh, this uh, distortion from recombination is very very low on this scale you can see it's lower even of order one one uh, ten times lower than the mu distortion because it has many spectral fe features it actually is is somehow easier to detect and disentangle from uh, from foregrounds because it has many many uh, features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, low frequency foregrounds for mu distortion are definitely a big challenge, uh, but but obviously everywhere we are talking about many orders of layers uh, of peeling off. But I'm always thinking the, about the analogy of gravitational wave detection, where you have to uh, you know make sure that everything is isolated and no uh, ten to minus nine uh, and whatever effects uh, get propagated to the final signal. So I. I think I think uh, with obviously enough data and uh, creative methods, we might be getting there. That makes Hopefully. a lot of sense, and also your comment on the spectral features makes a lot of sense and and how we can use them. Because I mean, I think about even like transiting planet detections. We don't need stable photometry over long times, but you can still detect those features. Right. So, right. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. maximizing those nulls and that sort of thing seems really interesting way forward. Um, I wondered if uh, Julian Munoz, do you want to um, unmute yourself and pick one of the questions that you asked to, to ask live? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I was wondering, Jens, uh, we have this big wide distortion from clusters, but this this other new physics uh, processes might be there. How can you distinguish between them if the frequency signal is about the same? Yeah, so, so um... Uh, this is a great question. So the Y type distortion, um, this is one of the things that I mentioned very big at the very beginning can be formed both from very low redshifts by clusters as Julian is saying, and that's the dominant signal, but we can in principle have a Y type distortion also formed uh, around recombination just by heating of the electrons. 
Um, in that case, you wouldn't be talking about million Kelvin electrons upscattering photons normally. You would normally talk about just like a small temperature difference between electrons and photons. And those processes a priori cannot be directly distinguished. However, again, um, clusters of galaxies is one of those things and uh, somehow people of, often think of this as a, as a you know a reason why spectral distortions might not be as interesting in the sense of uh, for the cluster physics you have um, you will have many many measurements of um, oh i did uh, yes here you will have many measurements from x rays uh, you will have many measurements even large scale structure measurements and that way you can actually model or at least resolve um, uh, a large fraction of the of the population of clusters that will contribute. Now, this is here basically the relative contribution as a, a function of the mass of the system. And spectral distortions get you get you still twenty percent more systems. So it's not like everything is totally uh, the same. But in principle, you could hope for taking these clusters and actually reducing at least uh, the the uh, contribution by some significant fraction. And potentially uh, through cross correlations, you can maybe even you know uh, take some additional layers off. So this might be allowing you to push this you know detection limit, let's say for primordial Y distortions uh, to maybe a little bit lower, uh, maybe a factor of 10, maybe even dreaming a factor of 100 lower. Uh, so to 1% precision, let's say we can maybe but, but, but take away some layers. You still have reionization in addition to clusters. Correct. And I was about saying the reionization uh, one is something that you want to actually measure as well. And that's roughly one order of magnitude, uh, you know, depending on if you take V over C square, uh, square terms into account, two orders of magnitudes, that's where these signals are. Um, and you want to measure them as well. So if you had a factor of 10 reduction, you would actually start seeing those. Yes, I, I agree with it. That's a very important point. Yes, thank you. And then there is also some interesting um, uh, atomic physics that allows you to, in principle, distinguish pre-recombination Y distortions from post-recombination Y distortions, because if the CMB is actually uh, distorted, then the spectrum that we would be calculating with the recombination lines does not look uh, like this uh, spectrum, but there will be small changes in the in the features, and even you can even have cases where you can get uh, uh, strong changes in the features, uh, depending on how much uh, distortion in the pre-recombination universe you already have present. And I'm now working on a very detailed paper in that direction, and that would be telling you, oh, there's actually a wide distortion type introduced at earlier times, uh, and that would be another way of of labeling things. But yeah, this is this is definitely uh, important. So why that part cannot be used to constrain new physics as easily, but the mu type part is something that's unique to the early universe. That's great. Thanks, Jens. Thank you so much. Um, I think we should probably close there, and but there are more questions than I was able to ask live online, and and yeah, no. let's all thank both of our speakers again. We're really grateful for you taking the time and, and balancing the time zones to be here with us um, during a, a time of a lot of challenges. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank, thanks a lot, yeah. Um, uh, so on Slack, there's more questions. I will That's be right. uh, looking yeah. at those. Yeah, great. OK, thank thanks you. a lot, everybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye then. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. thanks again for organizing. We're really grateful yeah, Exactly. To thanks a lot, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to have you. <laughs>